Good evening, uh, our esteemed guests, regular members of Masterminds. I am honored to give the introduction of the speaker and little bit things about the organization which we represent, Mastermind. It commenced with a 21 days program initiated by Dr. Thomas George, which continued by the participation of all the people for the last more than 400 days on regular basis without break. We meet every day at 9 p.m. Indian time. We discuss about uh, all the topics under the sun. We invite guest speakers from across the world and we are getting enlightenment with the inputs of this, uh, our guest speakers. Today, we have uh, another great uh, armed force personnel with us. In fact, we were lucky enough to have the presence of certain armed force personnel earlier also, Major General Chaco, then Colonel Revi, and today we are having this uh, Admiral Kananji. We, in fact, we are blessed with his presence because he is a person with nearly 40 years of experience with Indian Navy. After graduating from uh, Trivandrum Engineering College, he joined Indian Navy and got his elevations up to the level of Vice Admiral. And uh, uh, during the journey, his career journey, he occupied several important positions, including Nuclear Submarine uh, Director. He got the coveted awards from President of India for his distinguished service, the Vishishta Seva Medal, Ati Vishishta Seva Medal, Parama Vishishta Seva Medal. It's a great achievement. Post retirement, he had the feel of corporate world being MD and CEO of uh, Atlantic Shipbuilding at Chennai. And presently, he has settled down at Coimbatore. His wife, Dr. Nirmala, a gynecologist, she also was in Indian Navy, rose up to the rank of rear admiral. And they are the first admiral couple in Indian Navy. So welcome friends, our uh, uh, great army man, uh, Admiral Karnan. And we do have, I am seeing some other admirals also in our uh, gathering today. It's a great honor for we people to have uh, such senior armed, armed force people with us because they are the people who are having amazing experience, who can really guide us, who can really motivate us with their experience. So we are eagerly waiting uh, Admiral Kandanji. He is the brother of our regular member, Mr. Hadiharan. So that is another advantage and another pleasure for all family members of Mastermind. So. Over to Kananji. We are waiting for uh, your uh, deliberations. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vinay Krishnan. Uh, I'm audible. If somebody can raise a finger and tell me. Okay, fine. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, lead masterminds, for extending an opportunity to me. Lost audio, sir. Sir, sir, sir you, sir, you muted you yourself, yourself, I think. No, I think I uh, accidentally touched the mouse. Okay. I'll keep the mouse away from this. So a few aspects of an emerging concept called Industry 4.0, which you may see later, is largely a technological enabler. I'm also thankful to Mr. Winnie Krishnan for a very generous introduction. Uh, and I uh, thank uh, this opportunity also to my brother, who had in fact suggested to me that uh, I could perhaps uh, join for one of the evening uh, talks. Now, I have a presentation, but before I go to the first slide, I, I just want to uh, share with you that in this audience today, there are a large number of engineers, there are a few doctors, there are some educationists, bankers, one of them is my brother, of course, and other professionals, and many of them may not have come across this concept of 4.0. So it will be my endeavor for the next 40 odd minutes to make a very simple presentation to you, which would incorporate 
the essential structure of 4.0, what are the benefits one would have if you uh, practice 4.0 in your organization, uh, the benefits realized and the potential it has, and of course the challenges the organization would face uh, while adopting this. So it does not come so easily without you have to do some work as well. So I'll go to my first slide, I'll upload my uh, screen. Uh, are you able to see this? If somebody can raise a finger. So yes, sir, we can see. Right. So I started my presentation and uh, the first slide is just saying that I'm going to talk about Industry 4.0. And anyway, uh, what is Industry 4.0? Why is it called like this? Have you heard uh, Industry 1.0 and 2.0 or 3.0 earlier? When so many uh, various technologies were developed. So, towards understanding this, how this got named as 4.0, I would like to trace some of the technological advancements of earlier decades. Over 250 years back, it's a long time back, we had the Industrial Revolution which all of us have learned in our uh, school days. And one of the major inventions which took place at that point of time was that of steam engine, which was recorded nearly 45 years back. I'm sorry, 240 years back. So nearly 240 years back, you had the steam engine, which was developed and Many developments subsequently came by way of steam-driven railways, steam-driven uh, vessels in the uh, rivers. We had various industrial uh, applications come. This enabled also a huge impetus to other industrial activities. And this was the starting point of a major uh, activity curve if you take major point in the industrial revolution uh, time in about 240 years back. A hundred years later, around uh, 1870, as you can see on the slide, we had the technological advancement of generation and distribution of electrical power, electrical power to our offices, homes, schools, hospitals, workshops and that brought about a series of different type of machinery, equipment and automation all working on the newly available electrical energy at your workplace or at your home. Most of these inventions which followed uh, 1870 were hardware intensive and large, largely analog by nature. Why I'm saying that is, uh, it is still not digital. That's what I meant. By about 1940s, when uh, the Second World War was at its peak, scientists could develop a very primitive digital computer in the laboratory, which got improved upon the succeeding 20 years. And by about end 60s, we had the first digital computer available uh, for industrial application and of course for R&D as well. Now, with digital computers coming in, there were software control operations possible, the versatility of which kept improving year after year. It also improved the speed and accuracy of your computation. And at the same time, the digital computers became more and more compact. I'm suddenly reminded of my days in engineering college. We were in the final year in 1973. Uh, and I was doing electronics at the time. So 
com uh, digital computers were very much on in our syllabus, but we are only reading some books saying this is how the digital computer will work. And we were told one day that all of us are going to see a digital computer installed in a place called Tumba, where today the ISRO Space Center is located. At that time, it was not called Space Center, it was called TURLS. And some of the elderly people who are in this group will know what is TURLS. It was Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station. So we went to TURLS and we were told the Russian computer Minsk has arrived and it has been installed in TURLS. All of you engineering graduates, you will get to see the computer. So we were very quite thrilled that we, so we took a trip to TURLS, whole class went and we reached some building and then they took us to uh, the first floor and then through the window, they showed us a huge room filled with big structures like cupboards, one after the other, about 10, 15 of them. And then we asked, uh, this looks like a library. Uh, what is this? So no, this is the computer. This is the computer which has come from Russia, which we'll be using for our um, R&D applications in uh, Tumba. And that was a mainframe computer, the initial mainframe computer, one of the first computers which have come to India. We got a chance to see it. And thereafter, if you see, computers have collapsed in their size. They become so compact, became desktop after some time, laptop, then palm top, and on and on like this. But the fact is, whatever be the shape or size which has taken the last 20 years, it has become a very integral part of our life, be it at work or be it at home. And the power these computers have, which I'm calling as digital power, is a significant enabler for us today. And that change which has happened in the early 2000s is a significant milestone which we have crossed in our technological path. When I say we means, I mean humanity. Uh, maybe India has come with these developments a few years after what has happened in the West, but this has been a significant milestone. So the three milestones which you see on the screen, first is steam, which you had 40 years back, then electrical energy, about uh, another 140 years back. And then you had now digital computer, which has been on since 1970 and is improving day after day. This is what is called Industry 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. They all been named retrospectively by engineers, saying this is what 1, 2, 3, and thereafter, we will see how we can go to 4. Now, the journey on digital power, as I mentioned earlier, is continuing. But in the last 15 years or so, it has revolutionized so much on communication over internet, mobile communication, and satellite communication. And thanks to all this, we have been able to have access to information almost in real time, as what they call in engineers, near real time, of an event which is happening thousands of miles away which have been communicated through the cyberspace to our homes or to our office. So if you're working in an organization, right? I, I put a small rectangle next saying your department, it could be your organization. It is possible for you, your organization, to put out a lot of data through the net, or through the Wi-Fi within the intranet <coughs> about your organization's performance. And you can imagine what I've shown in the form of a cloud. You can imagine there's another computer which can well be in the same floor of your office, connected through fiber optics, or it can be in another building, or it can be thousands of miles away. It can be a server located in another country which is capturing all this data which you have sent, a large amount of data called big data. 
and that computing power there is able to analyze the trends of performance of a of your department predict what can happen and evolve solutions if the performance has to be improved and it can communicate back to you saying what you can be uh, correcting if there's any correction to be done or what will be the prediction which they have made it also studies if in your process in your department has got repetitive work then it also examines whether you can have a robot which can do some of the work which otherwise is being done manually of course taking a lot of time so the physical office of your department is getting integrated in a virtual domain to a virtual domain computer which does all the back end work for you and does some future predictions and gives you some answers now this integration between a physical activity happening in your department and a virtual domain which is analyzing it and telling you back is called industry 4.0 so industry 4.0 is the ability for a department to utilize a power located somewhere else in a virtual domain which will do specific tasks for you and give you answers while you continue with your work well if you're not giving data then he is not doing it which uh, the virtual domain is not doing anything for you then you're not doing industry 4.0 but if you're giving the data of course it'll be in a secure manner then it's possible for you to get the benefit of this power huge power which is there in this virtual domain and that is industry 4.0 and today we're going to just discuss some of the applications which are there in our country some of the applications are there in some western countries and how we can look at it for replicating it in india or customizing it for our requirements and we can also look at uh, very briefly what are the benefits we'll have and what are the challenges of course we'll face when you adopt uh, 4.0 so i'm taking a very simple example very simple example in industry 1.0 you can see a machine operated by a man standing next to it you can imagine it is like the driver of the steam engine train he is standing almost next to the engine and is driving it local control as we call it and that is akin to industry 1.0 but when it came to 2.0 electrical energy was available so the machine control could be done from another room which is almost a practice now in industries on board ships on board aircrafts and so many places and it is hardwired to the machine to do the control and what we normally call it as remote control so that is industry 2.0 i'm just giving this example for us to just consolidate our transition from 1 to 2 and then we come to 3 when it came to 3 digital computers were there and the operators now free to walk around with a controller and through wifi he is able to control the machine you must have seen so many videos in whatsapp where a truck driver uh, gets out of the truck and then he stands by the side of the road and controls the truck so that it can very carefully go through a very narrow road and he is not driving near the steering wheel he is standing outside the truck there are so many applications within our country where cranes are operated by the man standing on the floor and not on top of the crane and he operates the crane through a wifi control so that is the main industry 3.0 now let us look at what will be 4.0 when it comes to 4.0 you have the machine little more smart now because it has to put out a lot of data which goes through a communication tender to through a satellite and the man 
can be somewhere else in another country, another place, and then he is able to monitor how the machine is working. Uh, is it satisfactory? Is the health all right, etc. Now, this reminds me of an international event which took place in 2014. In 2014, Malaysian Airlines lost an aircraft having a flight number MH370. All of us have read about it. It took off, and after some time, uh, when it was about to leave Malaysian airspace, it, it was lost. People feared that it has crashed somewhere. They couldn't find the debris. And the reason for the accident or for the loss and how it disappeared is not known even today. But there was one report which came immediately after this accident. Boeing company in US who monitors every aircraft engine started or stopped in its, fact, in its health center, because that is how engines of aircrafts are wired through the satellite, they get the information, it has started, it is running at so-and-so speed, and a few other parameters like temperature, pressure, etc. It reported the aircraft engine was running for eight hours after takeoff. So obviously it had not crashed. It was flying to some other place. And uh, where exactly it flew to? What exactly happened to the aircraft? What happened to the crew? Why it happened? There are a lot of uh, stories on the net. If we have time in the end, we can exchange one or two of that. But what I'm trying to say is, it is possible for someone sitting in USA to monitor the health of the engine fitter in MS370, which is flying, which was flying from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. So that is the level of uh, automation. That is the level of integration which machines had through satellite link, through digital link. A good example of Industry 4.0, but in this case, unfortunately, the aircraft was not. So let us look at, take a quick recap of what should be there in Industry 4.0, the facets of uh, Industry 4.0. First of all, the equipment have to be smart. That means they should be, when I say smart, they should not be They should be able to communicate, exchange a lot of data uh, to the operator or to the virtual uh, domain where you want some analysis to be done but it should be capable of giving that data. Second, you may also employ robo, if there's a lot of repetitive process taking place in your department, as I said earlier. And of course, these days, there are machines which are more than smart. They're capable of learning themselves and they themselves fix if there is some uh, malfunction noticed and they will do a corrective action. They call learning uh, uh, themselves. Uh, machine learning as they're called. These are also there as facets of Industry 4.0. I'm just exchanging, uh, telling you these uh, important uh, words so that you get an overall idea of what all developments are taking place around the world. Second, very simple, internet should be there with wide connectivity and smart equipment, they should be interoperable. That means they should speak the same protocol, they should be able to put out data in the same protocol so that whoever is receiving it is able to give it to another equipment and take that information also. And these have got standardized in digital communication a big way in the past uh, 25, 30 years. And so that is another aspect of Industry 4.0. You're able to do near time data analysis through cyber integration. We already talked about it. And lastly, knowledge you have gathered or have uh, imbibed 
by being in the department or uh, in the organization, you are able to share back through the virtual domain. Of course, it comes as a suggestion from the computer and that is called as artificial intelligence. So these are the various facets of industry 4.0, which are engulfed in the virtual domain and you can pull out out of this whole host of facilities available in the virtual domain to suit your requirement, to suit your operation and benefit by having this additional knowledge, by having the uh, speed with which the data is coming and also the accuracy with which it is coming. So there should be some benefits. So let's look at the benefits. I will take uh, two sectors only for the time being, manufacturing sector and service sector. First, manufacturing sector, people who have introduced uh, 4.0 techniques definitely confirm there's a productivity enhancement, augmentation is there. Uh, a lot of my colleagues from uh, LNT are here today and they will agree that the 4.0 which we have created in our shipyard has enabled uh, enhancement of productivity. It has also uh, taken the level of safety to a higher look, level and definitely the quality of work. So you have productivity, safety, quality levels being improved upon. And these are the main things in the manufacturing sector. When it comes to the service sector, there's higher customer satisfaction. There's efficiency in the service which you're providing. And it is easily adaptable when you have a wide number, a large number of customers and governments or autonomous bodies or uh, local bodies like corporations, municipalities are to ensure governance to a wide number, wide area of activity the social responsibilities are very high, then 4.0 is easily adaptable. The benefits are huge because thousands and lakhs of uh, people are going to benefit from the timely, prompt, and speedy uh, action which the government body is taking. We'll touch upon this in some of the examples which I'm going to talk about. I will talk about four examples today. Two will be from the oxygen sector and uh, two will be from the manufacturing sector. Oxygen distribution hospital is the first example I would like to say. It's a very uh, current topic. We have been hearing, we have been reading, and we have been seeing also that many hospitals uh, have problems in ensuring uh, continuous supply of oxygen. For some reason, uh, there's a gap which is coming and perhaps the system they have, the instrumentation they have is not helping them uh, for the load of patients which are then the hospital. So we will see that first. So I'm just taking an example. There's a hospital with an oxygen bank supplying oxygen to three wards. Very simple, through a pipeline it goes. Now, uh, there are many patients uh, at in ward one, two, three. They could be of different categories, some requiring high flow oxygen, some require ventilator, some require low flow oxygen. And they are prioritized like that by doctors at different levels because the oxygen demand varies depending upon your category. And whenever the pressure falls, then there is uh, a requirement to disconnect this cylinder, which is almost empty, and connect up other cylinders or another bank of cylinders. That is done by the hospital staff. But it is when the pressure drops in one ward or all the wards, this happens. Now, I'm just telling how 4.0 can come into a very simple facility like this, but very critical facility. Let's look at it. I'm suggesting the hospital should have four flow meters put. 
and three towards and one from the main bank. These flow meters are capable of, they're smart flow meters. They're capable of communicating to hospital computer how much oxygen has flown past those pipes. Now, depending upon the population in each ward and the category of patients, which is known to the hospital computer, the hospital computer can predict ward one will consume X liters of oxygen per minute, while two and three may be something else. And the flow meter will tell you how much has been consumed. So there's a prediction based on what doctors believe uh, a patient should get and category of patients uh, are determined by doctors. And there's a prediction of how much oxygen will get consumed and the flow meter will tell you how much has been consumed. And there's a dashboard which is available in the hospital, in the each ward, in the control room, and perhaps in somewhere else with the medical uh, department, tell you how the level is coming down slowly. It's not just looking at pressure dropping, but how much quantity is reducing. So gradually the quantity keeps reducing. It can have some alarms in the system by which there is sufficient notice available for uh, changing the oxygen bank or getting some oxygen from somewhere else, but all this is possible. I'll tell you why this can be easily introduced. I'll give an example. 2013, or it could be uh, 14, Mumbai Municipal Corporation, Bombay Municipal Corporation, was having a lot of water problems. And it was uh, extremely serious in some ward where uh, a lot of low-income group people were staying. So they wanted uh, this to be studied by a consultancy group saying how uh, we are uh, not able to meet the requirements of these thousands of families staying here while we are giving a lot of water, but they are always complaining. So this consultancy group replaced all the meters in all the houses in that ward with smart water meter procured from Australia. And after they installed that, they were able to get how much water was flowing into each of those houses because it will communicate through Wi-Fi and will come to the control center. And they found the waters, water quantity consumed by houses was only 70% of the water given by the main pump house. And then they understood there's a lot of leakage in those lines. So they started putting meters upstream and localize these leakages and then they found some pilferage also. So they were able to improve after a lot of effort, the water supply situation in this ward, which is done on a trial basis, that they could enhance the water supply by 25% because it was not getting pilfered, nor was it getting lost. In this diagram, which I've shown, if the flow meters of three wards, if they add up, and does not come to the flow meter of the oxygen bank, then obviously oxygen is getting leaked out somewhere. So it is also good for maintenance checks. So it is possible by introducing uh, a simple smart equipment, but utilizing the computing power of a computer which is outside the oxygen system and then give a prediction back and give an alarm and you're able to improve. To my knowledge, this has not been done uh, in any of the hospitals in India yet, but easily in Pune, there has been an attempt or there has been an effort uh, by the Pune hospital uh, to save on oxygen by just making sure uh, the oxygen thing is closed when the patient goes away for a walk or goes to the washroom and things like that. This is like you closing the tap 
when you are finished with the work. Uh, but some online system like this can give some help. I will now go to another example, which is manufacturing. This is the construction site. And in this construction site, and I'm taking a big construction site where there are uh, uh, excavation um, equipment, there machinery, there is crane, and so many other machinery as well. Now, I'm taking the example of LNT. LNT recently, when I say recently, means about three, four years back, had got all this machinery fitted with a modem, which is Wi Fi compatible, and the Wi Fi was the site location Wi Fi. So if you start a crane, the information goes saying crane has been started through the Wi Fi because the modem takes that information and gives it to site office. Similarly, for all other mobile uh, equipment and machinery, and including uh, anything which is uh, static as well. With the result, the site office was able to know for how many hours in a day each of those equipment were operated. Of course, you can get the same information by uh, calling the people at the end of the day and asking how many hours they operated. You will take some time. You will take their time also. But here online it comes without you have to having to trouble anyone. And cranes especially will also tell you how much weight they are lifting because that was also wired through the modem. So it is possible for uh, the site office to know whether the machinery was being exploited uh, efficiently, being deployed correctly, are they having too much of resource, are they uh, spending too much of diesel on running it idle? All these calculations they could do. It, the computer had the program for it. So it will throw up all this value, the graphs. By end of the day, you knew what was your performance in that site. The head office, which was connected through internet, got the same information from many sites. And LNT has about 30, 40 construction sites. So what happens is they find in some place utilization is low, some other place utilization is very high, and they are waiting. They will do better if they have one more crane. So they're able to do resource allocation uh, bit from one site to another site if it is geographically possible. And that way, they are able to have judicious exploitation of their capital assets which is a huge benefit uh, for, for the country, uh, for the company. So machinery, which are, uh, I'm sorry, I think I, okay. so I already mentioned to you, it is possible for the machine to be exploited better, not only in one site, but also over many sites. Now let's look at manpower. In manpower, what uh, has been done, it, is, it has been done in my earlier company as well. Uh, every man who was coming to work was RFID tagged on his helmet. So his time of arrival at the gate, time of arrival of coming to the workplace, time of arrival uh, uh, for uh, uh, back to the workshop for lunch or tea, then going back again to the so it is possible to make a very clear assessment of time and task by the computer itself. You, 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 it was, the helmet was compulsory, a part of your uniform or what of your dress, and it was tagged by the Wi-Fi system. If anyone entered an area which was hazardous because of some specific construction activity, or it was a tank where some uh, fumes could be there and they should not go inside without supervision. That would be also separately noted. An alarm will come saying four people have entered this tank. They should have a supervisor. The computer will say supervisor is also there. 
because his RFID tag has also been read. So it is possible to enhance your safety in your organization, in your factory, by simple method of making sure people are safety conscious, of course, but you have the not very expensive IT hardware to make sure you are able to see the movement of your people from one location to another, and you are able to see the time on task, which is linked to productivity, as well also access control, which is directly linked to safety. Now, this reminds me of what happened in February in Uttarakhand. All of us saw there was a deluge, there's a cloud burst, and uh, we had lots of people trapped in a tunnel. And uh, there were not very clear reports uh, from the construction company or the project uh, in charge, but how many people were inside the tunnel. Today, we undertake so much of work for metros, for so much of other uh, underground work. It will be a good investment for companies to make sure the manpower they are deploying to hazardous zones are tracked and are uh, accounted at the end of the day that everybody has left. Computer will say everybody has left the site because they've gone out of the gate. And if somebody has not gone out of the gate, it will tell you that 10 people are still not gone. They are somewhere. They could be slowly uh, sauntering back to the gate or they could be in the canteen uh, having a cup of tea. But the fact is, the computer will tell you uh, at the time of close that 10 people are still inside the factory. And another aspect is regarding material, which can also be included, but I have not included in the slide. Just to highlight to you that it's possible to enhance productivity and safety by using simple 2.0 techniques. Now, I'll go to another example. Anyone has an idea what is this building? Oh, title says, I'm sorry. It's the 3D printing house created at IIT Chennai. Correct. Uh, IIT Madras uh, in 3D printing in March 21. This is the second uh, building uh, printed in, in the country. There are many people who are not engineers in the audience. So for benefit of them, uh, I, I should, I'll dwell upon a little bit on how this house has been built uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, this is a 500 square foot house. And the cost I will tell you at the end of it. But uh, there's another double story building also built uh, by another company uh, in another place uh, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, uh, but I will focus on this particular uh, work which has been done by IIT Chennai. Now, how has this house been built? We are all familiar houses are built. There's a foundation and there's a basement and uh, there's a foundation, then there's walls and doors, willows, roof, etc. Now, this house is not built in that manner. You see on the left side, that is your plan of your house. And there is one robo in the center of the house. That robo has got a huge arm which goes round to cover all corners of this house and all the contours of the house. It adjusts itself. The computer, which has got the design of this house from a remote location, control remote location means could be 100 feet away, uh, controls this robo, which lays a thin film of special concrete along those entire walls, as you see. It's a thin layer of some, let us say, uh, three centimeters or four centimeters. It lays one layer. Then it waits for some time for it to dry up. Then it lays the next one and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, till it comes to the roof. 
the roof is prepared separately in another location, which is lifted and put on top of it. This is the technique of 3D printing using digital computers. And manpower required for this building construction is so limited, but you require an expensive robo. This was demonstrated uh, to the government in March 21. And the government is very seriously considering these type of houses for low income groups, uh, house for everyone, some private minister scheme is there. They're looking at this, whether this can be done. Any idea how much this house is, would cost a 500 square foot house? Anyone? 10 lakhs. 10 lakhs, okay. Anybody else? It is a cost of 5 lakhs and uh, it could be built within 10 days. So if you have to replicate similar design, house after house, or floor after floor, because two-story buildings have also been now tried out in 3D printing uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu in another location. Uh, and it is possible to enhance throughput of your industry by using this automation. So this is another example of how 4.0 can meet your urgent requirement at the same time, low cost. At the same time, you have good quality. The only disadvantage as I see is the employment of labor is significantly reduced because the labor which is there on site, uh, uh, only a portion of them are getting introduced, are being employed in the mix of concrete or bringing material from some other place to this, but not for actual construction. But the construction service is only taking 10 days. So you have uh, throughput in the number of buildings significantly, even though there is less em uh, employment potential. Now I come to my last example, which is something very close to my heart, because I never seen uh, in any city in India, uh, the best of cities people say it is Indore uh, or uh, Nagpur or uh, Surat was there earlier, where the population have been very efficient in garbage clearance. And I'm sure uh, there are many examples in the uh, cities where you, you live. Coimbatore is definitely an example that is not very efficient. So I'm just talking about a smart bin, which has been developed in USA. And it's presently uh, being used by more than 20 countries. What does a smart bin have? It is just like any other plastic bin for uh, putting the garbage, but it has got a motor inside which can compress the garbage to one third its volume. So, as we put more garbage, it compresses it, compacts it to a smaller volume, and the motor works on a battery. So, obviously, it has got a motor and a battery, and it has got some intelligence as well. It knows when to compact it. I'll come to that. The battery is charged by an inbuilt solar panel. So battery is always on charge. And there are uh, switches within the uh, garbage uh, bin that when it comes to 50% volume, it will compact it. Then after some time, it will again come to 50%, it will again compact it like that. When it comes to 75%, it will report to corporation office that I am 75% full through a modem, which also works on the solar panel. No, it, it may look a very precious uh, uh, garbage bin, which has got attractive items like battery and motor and solar panel, etc. But how it is being utilized, I'll just touch upon. It reports to the corporation office that it is 75% full. So by end of the day, corporation has got a very clear idea that how many bins need to be changed the next day. They don't change the bin every day. 
they don't run the transport to each location of every bin. They run it only where they have to change it. So next day, the bins are changed with a new one, which is fresh and clean. And the old one goes for emptying out, cleaned, and kept ready for the next trip. Now, compared to what happens, at least in my city, when a truck comes, it lifts a huge bin, which is almost half the size of the truck, and tries to empty it into the truck. Some falls outside, some falls inside the truck. But such a big bin, it, so much of power is required to lift it, and it is made of metal, which gets corroded. And when you lift it, you'll find something falls out from the bottom. It is very difficult to maintain. And it is impossible for the corporation to clean all the bin in three days. Only one third of the bins get cleared. And they go to some bins, which is not even one fourth full, but they skip some other bins, which are three fourths full. So what happens? What is the customer satisfaction? People find the garbage next to their house is almost overflowing, but it is not going to get lifted for next two days because the uh, program is that they will come only on the third day here to lift it. There, there isn't any automation by which it automatically directs the people to go to a particular venue where it is full. Somebody can ring up and say, the bin is overflowing, please come. They may oblige. But this process of using electronics and digital power along with the customer requirements has significantly enabled many cities world over to ensure their garbage clearance is prompt, speedy, and it satisfies the customer. Now, I finished my four examples. So these are indicative of what can happen in manufacturing. These are indicative of what can happen in service sector. Uh, what do you think the future will be of 4.0? Uh, let us look at it. The future of performance zero is going to be definitely the real world where we stay will get integrated with the virtual world where a lot of uh, mathematical uh, computing takes place and gives some solutions by which you can do a better job on the ground. Today, in our country, banking, social security, and retailing, I think they are fairly well established with many 4.0 activities, I mean, uh, 4.0 applications. Social security encompasses PAN, Aadhaar, voter ID, uh, passport and all those other uh, documentation which is required for a citizen. All these are interconnected with the address and mobile numbers, etc. It enables uh, the governance uh, of institutions so easy for it is almost very specific to a citizen because all his details are known uh, without uh, much infringement uh, to uh, data privacy. But if you look at the three blue rectangles on top, agriculture, education, and healthcare, these are three sectors where 4.0 can come. Agriculture started something called smart farming very uh, recently, about a year and a half, two back. Education has also started. You see a lot of online applications are coming up. A lot of agencies are dealing with online applications. Healthcare sector is a little lagging in this, even though telemedicine is one of them, which have been practiced significantly during this pandemic. But definitely at the institutional level, agriculture, education, and uh, healthcare can improve uh, our 4.0 applications. It can make uh, customer more satisfied. It can make service more efficient. And it can also uh, ensure that there is uh, money well spent on these advancements. But as I told you earlier, 4.0 comes with some challenges. You have to face that. You have to encounter that. 
and you have to look at how you can overcome it. So the challenges are, you need to have internet availability continuously, or if you're on a campus, it should be Wi-Fi available within the campus. Then only your data exchange takes place seamlessly. You're vulnerable to cyber attacks. You have to be cautious of this. You have to be conscious of this. You have to make sure that you follow a very high level of discipline while using uh, front-end IT hardware or IT infrastructure, which is going to speak to internet. And most of you are IT savvy, so you would be knowing what all precautions one has to take to, to prevent this malicious cyber attacks. Skill manpower is required, definitely for designing it, uh, designing your uh, very exclusive, customized, uh, virtual capability for your department or your organization is required. Uh, uh, I should share with you that it took us nearly uh, three to four years to develop a 4.4 system in our shipbuilding company in Chennai. And uh, we could bring about nearly about uh, 100 applications, which could uh, be uh, meeting the requirements of different departments, different customers, and uh, obviously uh, it had huge uh, uh, rewards to uh, management because you found uh, data was available and everybody was looking at the same data, same picture. And I should tell you this, there is a punchline from one of the companies which makes 4.0 applications for you. You want a 4.0 application, you can bring up this company and uh, they will come and discuss with you what is your manual process, how do you do it, uh, can I bring in some changes here, something here, some automation here, some robotics here, all the things they will do and they will develop a four-point system for you. But their tagline is, there's only one version of truth in the organization after 4.0 has come. It implies there are many versions of truth when there was no 4.0 because everybody was seeing the same picture. As long as you are authorized to see the picture, you had access to the picture so that data was not of convenience. It was absolutely firm and stable and people could respond to the situation they were seeing. And of course, IT infrastructure is required within the organization. Uh, there have been many developments which have taken place. Uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, constrained by time to share some more applications. So these challenges one has to meet if you want a 4.0 in your organization. So finally, let me conclude. 4.0, it harnesses cyber power to tackle your big data, real-time analysis, it can give you even some artificial intelligence solutions, all looking at efficiency, quality, and safety. It also promises to evolve machine learning and uh, knowledge-based automation in organization. What was happening uh, 25 years back was you had an elderly man or some senior hierarchy who had spent many years in the organization who knew what was done earlier, what failures took place and how it was tackled or there were books written. There were standard operating procedures prepared. You had to consult that and then do it. Now, all those knowledge collection, aggregation is in a single repository in the virtual domain, just like internet. Within your own organization, you can have a very specific hierarchy by which you can look at uh, quality department, look at their previous performance, look at what improvements have done, how to do it, what et cetera, what is the plan? Everything can be done and that will enable you to perform better. But it requires, as I told you, smarter equipment which are compatible, which can give data, skill manpower, assured internet connectivity and I better structure. And most important, the people should have cyber discipline. Just like in the times of this pandemic where you say you have to have COVID discipline, masking and social distance, just like that. When you come to 
these IT infrastructure, which is connected with your 4.0. You may be working from home, but you have to follow your discipline of how you will operate in the cyberspace from office or be from home so that you are not subjected to any surprise phishing or cyber attacks. With this, I conclude my talk and uh, I thank once again uh, the organizers and Mr. Unni Krishnan, the host, for giving me this opportunity. I may have overshot, overshot a little bit in time, but I hope I've been able to share with you what 4.0 promises and how you will be able to guide your younger people who will have to introduce in the years to come 4.0 in various organizations. Thank you and Jai Hind.